Hello, fellow do-gooders and friends. I'm your host, Karina Belizzi, an activist and cause marketer who's passionate about social impact and sustainability. In this episode, we are going to talk about building businesses that give back. From pay it forward companies that donate a portion of their profits to a cause, to those like Bomba Socks that follow a buy one, give one product as a cause perspective. To guide us on this journey, I am joined by Masami Sato. Masami was born in Japan and has become a citizen of the world. As she's traveled the globe, she became deeply concerned with the inequalities and social challenges so many people faced. By taking a completely new look at the power of giving, she founded B1G1, which stands for Buy One, Give One in 2007. She has authored four books, including Joy, The Gift of Acceptance, Trust and Love, Giving Business, Creating the Maximum Impact in the Meaning Driven World, and Better Business, Better Life, Better World. Masami's career has followed her diverse talents and skills, having been a teacher, a translator, a natural food chef, and farmer, author, and award-winning entrepreneur, as well as a mother of two teenagers. She is a two-time TEDx speaker and frequently invited to international events, interviews, and podcasts just like this one. Masami, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you so much, Corina. Thank you for having me. I'd like to first talk about the experiences you had that led you to want to create B1G1. Tell us about the inequalities you saw as you traversed the globe and the motivations you had behind getting this started. Well, um, I'm actually a quite a simple person, so I don't see things from a very complex place. But for me, um, I was very lucky to have the opportunity to travel around the world, you know, take a few years uh, in my youth to backpack. And, uh, you know, backpacking is not such a luxurious thing because you, are, you don't have so much money and you are on tight budget and you are kind of being creative about how to save so you can stay away <laughs> longer. And, and so I was very close to the ground and uh, being a person who didn't even speak English at that time, you know, very well, uh, I had to kind of you know, really learn everything, connect with people, being vulnerable and uh, experiencing everything without, you know, judging or um, and being open. And so during that time, I actually felt quite amazed because um, when I was uh, even younger and growing up in Japan, I was a very shy person and I had the trouble like speaking to strangers, even in my own community. So I was very quiet child, very shy, uh, very nervous to speak to people. But when I, uh, you know, went out into the world out of curiosity of wanting to see what was out there, then I realized that at one point I had to really let go. And I started to talk to strangers because I really had to, otherwise I couldn't survive. Right? <laughs> so, and I also um, not having the perfect language to speak with people um, made me become much simpler in terms of, you know, not worrying about it saying the right thing or you know I could just express myself in a simple way so with that I realized I could connect with people and I enjoyed so much to uh, interact and connect with people and I realized that actually the world wasn't a scary place because everywhere I went I always uh, met some very kind generous people who helped me whenever I needed help so um so that, that was kind of joy of traveling. But then another thing I saw was that whilst I was really enjoying this experience, there was one thing that didn't make sense to me, which was that uh, in some countries, um, even young children weren't going to school. And uh, for mm -hmm. example, begging on the street or working in the field because they just, uh, uh, you know, education wasn't available for them or family thought that kids working was normal or so mm -hmm. or, or people with physical disabilities actually sleeping on the street. And I, I thought, oh, my gosh, like if this was happening in my own hometown, surely somebody would something to do to, 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 to help. But yeah. those uh, that wasn't available, that help wasn't available for so many people. And so I started to wonder, like, why is this happening? And, uh, you know, I remembered my parents working really hard um, because uh, Japan was, uh, you know, experiencing this economic boom when I was growing up. So my father always felt that he had to work harder to 
gain better social status or more money or um, and he sacrificed so much for the family to get more and we had you know enough like I mean we weren't a rich family and we were kind of not that well to do but then still we had everything we needed to survive mm -hmm. so I thought like wow like there are lots of people who had enough but they didn't seem to feel fulfilled <laughs> But then at the same time, in other parts of the world where there were people who had very little or almost nothing, but then in those countries I went, people were still actually generous. Like they invited me to eat with them or stay with them. And I thought like, well, you have nothing and you are giving me your food. And um, so that was kind of didn't make sense to me. And so instead of looking things from the statistics or you know like global facts and then going yeah. like oh there is inequality and this is the poverty line or I didn't know any of those things it's just that personally things didn't make sense to me at that time <laughs> right well I mean you've touched on a few things that I just brought me right back to my 20s personally like uh, you mentioned backpacking around the world and, and wanting to experience and see different places you talked about how shy you used to be and I feel like you were describing me at that age. <laughs> so um, it was something I definitely also battled. I traveled across Europe um, backpacking. And because mm -hmm. I was in the Western world in Europe, there wasn't a lot of people living in the streets and there wasn't um, the same kind of inequity that you're talking about. There was wealth disparity for sure. But like you were speaking of earlier, most people had enough. Um, I also was struck by the generosity of people who didn't have as much mm -hmm. and by the fact that even being somebody who didn't speak the language, um, I was greeted with generosity and people that wanted to help. And once I got over the hurdle of feeling like I couldn't communicate well enough, that my world opened up and that mm -hmm. these people ended up being a part of my community, even though I was a stranger in a strange land in so many ways. So, you know, it's obvious to me that you're coming from a place of the heart and you're, you're trying to, you're, while you're noticing all of these inequities, um, inequitable situations where you have people who have a lot and then people who have almost nothing. Um, and you're looking at children who are forced to work either through cultural habit because they need to contribute to the household and there isn't enough. So they're not able to go to mm -hmm. school. And you're looking at all of these social problems and how you can fix them. So I, I'm, I'm like, really, what happens next? You know, you get B1G1 started, the brainchild <laughs> is born. Talk about that moment and how you got it together. Like, I, I want to learn about the first like three mm. or four clients you brought on and what that was like mm. and, and how you moved them through change. Because in that first stage, it's like that first step is always the hardest mm. to make, right? Mm. And actually, um, there was a, a gap between, you know, the experience of seeing what was happening in the world to the time I realized that I would do something about it. Like there was a period of time I just had no idea if I could, there could be anything that I would do, like in that situation. So what happened was after traveling, I kind of like, uh, you know, moved on with my life and I worked and then eventually I, uh, I became pregnant and I, I gave birth to my very first child. Um, and that was like a few years after I stopped traveling. So to me, that was the moment because until then I could say, well, there are lots of things happening in the world, but there isn't anything I could do. Right. I, I was just a small person. <laughs> and but then when I actually held my daughter in my arms, that was the first time I just really, really felt compelled by this like uh, feeling of love and connection, you know, with this little thing in my arms. And and then I realized, wow, like I love her so much and I, I would do anything to protect her and nurture her and make sure she would have a happy, fulfilling life. But then, um, uh, you know, in the first few weeks of experiencing that really deep sense of love and connection, there was a moment where I actually started to see faces of other kids that I met along the way. And then I realized, well, actually, my daughter happened to be very lucky 
to be born in a you know country where everything was provided. But then there are lots of other kids who who were who just were born in different environment, and as a result, they may not have a safe place or a family uh, who would support them to to you know study and learn and live great life. And so I thought that the, of course I still couldn't fix the world's problems like by myself, but I thought I would do something about this rather than just uh, taking care of my own family. So that was when I became an entrepreneur. And so with a three month old baby daughter on my back, I started my very first business because business felt like being in charge of something. And, uh, you know, with three months old baby, I probably couldn't get a job and go to work with her on my back. But if it's a business, I could do it. <laughs> so, with your own business. Um, I, You're the boss. Yes. You're the creator. <laughs> yes, I decide. So, um, yeah, I ended up um, uh, running this like a takeaway food store because I was passionate about food, but I didn't have a lot of money. But, but the buying a struggling business uh, that where the owner wanted to get out of business was actually affordable. Like I just had a you know, thousand dollars or something to buy this first business and started one and then eventually built the business and then became two businesses and eventually sold those two and moved from New Zealand where I was back then to Australia to expand my business. So my like food company was uh, growing and my vision was that uh, by providing the healthy food options to busy working people in Australia um, and I wanted to give all the profits of the business so that we could help um, feed and educate the street kids in some of the countries I visited so that was like the idea and then so what happened was about six years into this entrepreneurial like you know journey as a business owner always wanting to make a difference i realized it wasn't so easy to do <laughs> even though my company was growing and we had uh, at one point uh, you know frozen meal production facility and we were wholesaling our products to over 150 stores in different states in australia so our business it was growing but then i always had an excuse uh, to say to myself that we weren't ready yet you know we still weren't making money uh, that profit because we are putting all the money back into business to uh, improve the packaging marketing uh, you know big bigger freezer room like mm. all that so i thought like if i kept going like this maybe in 10 or 20 years time i would still be telling the same story to myself and said oh we are not ready yet you know we don't we're not making much money yet or something so i thought it was really ridiculous that we i would postpone things that i was most passionate about but i just still didn't have a time you know um so one day this simple thought came to me and it was that instead of trying to do something big in the future, what about we do something small, but do it every day? Because mm -hmm. a small thing can be done, but big thing cannot be done now. <laughs> so the idea of B1G1, you know, sounds like b one one sounds a little bit weird because of the wording B1G1, what is it? But the idea was buy one, give one. Like every time somebody purchases a product, what about one special thing happens in the world? And we decided that we will contribute a small portion of our, you know, uh, product, uh, you know, price uh, toward uh, uh, providing a meal to a child in India at that time, so that they would be encouraged to continue going to school. And um, with the research, I found the right NGO, which will facilitate the giving for something like 25 cents. And then we thought, well, like we can afford this because 25 cents can be used on a sticker, you know, right. like a beautiful sticker, but we don't need that beautiful sticker, but we want a heart in our business. So, and I, um, so I, have to, <laughs> I have to interject here because I think um, this was my first misnomer when I looked at your company, I thought B1G1, mm -hmm. I come from the world of sales and marketing. So commonly that's used as an acronym for buy one, get one or buy one, give one. Mm -hmm. And so on first pass, somebody might think, well, I just don't have the margin to give a whole one for everyone I sell. I mean, I'm not Tom's shoes when they got their start. That's how they started, right? For every mm -hmm. pair of shoes they sold, they would give another pair forward. Since then, you know, the company's gone through some changes. They don't do it exactly mm -hmm. that way anymore. They're mm -hmm. providing resources to a select number of charities and a percentage of profits goes to those, right? But that's part of, I think, the scaling of a company. At a certain point, they're like, well, I've 
given all the shoes that we intended to, and now what, right? So we want to have bigger impact in another way. But recently there was a new company that came out in the United States. And I mentioned this in the opening Bombas Socks. Their whole concept is really around giving a pair of socks for every pair of socks that they make, Mm -hmm. but that pair of socks goes to a homeless person and they're using it to raise awareness about a particular issue. In this case, it's the fact that homeless people don't often get enough um, donated socks or underwear because those are not items that are typically uh, donated to places like Goodwill. They have to be provided new. And so because they have to be provided new, there was this giant gap in um, their availability to those that need the most. Homeless people often don't have the ability to go to a laundromat. They're not going to use those few quarters they have to wash their clothes. So they'd wear the socks essentially until they're not wearable anymore and then need new ones, which I mean, it's a sad thing to think about, but that's a reality. So this company came out of the woodwork and said, we're going to bring awareness to this problem and help to solve it. That's one tactic to doing something like this. Mm. But what you're also advocating is it doesn't have to be that, that um, costly in one way, right? Like, so if you didn't have the margins to give another pair of socks away for every pair you sold, you could do something as simple as donate uh, a few cents per sale of an item mm. or a percentage, or even just like what the vitamin angels does recommend that a supplement company, you know, use that and say, we're going to give a quarter for every bottle we sell. Is that correct? Is that my understanding? Mm. So, because I think like giving the uh, what business is selling the actual item to mm. somebody else uh, is probably not feasible for most businesses. And also, it may not be so necessary to give that item, right? Like, because is it the way to really transform the issues and 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 help uh, make a difference in the long term? Then there are lots of different things in the world that we could support. Like planting trees is important, but is it every time you buy a tree, give a tree? <laughs> then, you know, like maybe we can't uh, plant enough trees to make sure that our uh, uh, rainforest is uh, supported. Um, and uh, so, um, what we are trying to do in B1 J1 model today, because at that time, you know, when I first started this in my own business, I was just one business and we just happened to be passionate about food, right? And then also education of the people. But then uh, several months after implementing that idea into my own company, I had another moment of realization where I realized that I knew so many other amazing business people and entrepreneurs um, and uh, they were my friends you know, my suppliers or other business friends. Mm -hmm. Um, And I knew they cared about something and uh, often they cared about the different issues in the communities or, you know. um, So I thought what if it was really easy for any business, not just the product business, but even accountants, legal firm or dentist, or if every business can find a way for them to make a meaningful impact and then make it part of their everyday business mm-hmm. rather than you know trying to set up a foundation one day when they become mega successful or <laughs> something. To, we do it now. Well, if and we then all wait, result, then what? Yeah, right? like if yeah. everybody's waiting, I get that. Yeah. Now, um, yeah. I saw an example on B1, G1 site where um, a woman was talking about her swim center and said that they mm. did something as simple as mm. Uh, Mm -hmm. give a gift on someone's birthday. So if someone turned 26 years old, they got to donate $26 to the charity of their choice. And so it was just Mm -hmm. an added benefit that they gave to their employees. I mean, I thought that was so creative. So I'd love for you to talk about some of the ways that you'd, Mm -hmm. you've integrated these ideas at B1G1 Mm -hmm. into the businesses that you work with. Mm. So um, when, you know, the one one idea became the idea that this is about all the businesses coming together, I, at that time, even though I loved my food company, I decided that it's time that I would actually uh, move on to set up this initiative. So I sold my company in Australia and moved to Singapore um, 
13 years ago to start the B1J1 as a uh, giving initiative, a social enterprise. And it's been you know, 13 years in making. And along the way, we realized that this is not necessarily about the typical buy one, give one thing to uh, you know, in, in embed giving in just the product, the sales and the services like every time. You know, we, we have plenty of these examples, like every time accountants create a client, they might give a goat to a family so that this family has a sustainable income. Or uh, even like we have a pest control company in UK uh, that you know gives and uh, support the children in conflict zones, uh, so that every pest control work that they do, and that's done by like army veterans because army veterans lost their job, uh, like they didn't have a job after coming back because they had this like a uh, you know trauma in some way. So they mm -hmm. decided to create the jobs for army veterans, but then army veterans really cared about the children in conflict zones, so they decided to you know embed the giving so every invoice they issue after doing the uh, test control work said you know thank you for choosing us because as a result we supported you know uh, x number of children and so that's an example and the same, same school in america in miami that example is like they do embed giving in what they do in swimming swimming lessons too but at the same time they realized that their company is made you know their acti business activities are made possible by their team members and team members are their family members and they care about them so much that they wanted to inspire them that they can also make a unique difference like so company itself give access to water to people like they are passionate about uh, supporting construction of wells to bring clean water to communities but then the team members may have a different passion like some team members may want to plant trees or they might want to support education or you know uh, medical give medical care to to disadvantaged people so um so many of the businesses that we work with are being very very creative and thinking about how they would embed this giving spirit in everything that they do so it's not necessarily sales based or income based and it could be just every email you know we send we we actually do this or every time somebody down download this like a special guide then we actually say to them well like thank you for downloading this and whilst you enjoy learning you also uh helps the children have uh you know joy of ed education or you know we help build the playground to these schools or so um there are like that you're mm -hmm. making that action based so it's like the birthday example mm -hmm. is one tune but you're saying mm -hmm. okay if they email like download this email guide or if they were to um execute an order i think you mentioned an accountant giving a goat every time he had a new client mm -hmm. or something like that i think that's all very creative and good i think it gets us outside of thinking about everything insofar as it's all about profit because i think at the end of the day that's kind of the problem if we think about business purely as about profit right mm -hmm. now you mentioned something earlier that um i've often thought about especially since starting this podcast and that is that um you know it was having a child that changed things for you and i i've heard this theme again and again and again and i feel like um it's probably the same for me in some ways too, right? Like I have two children now, they're age three and six. Um, I have been thinking about how uh, we have an impact on the planet more and more, especially as uh, grandparents gift us plastic toys and things along those lines that, you know, they're uh, expensive junk kind of, you know, cause they have short lives and they break and then what do you do with them type thing, you know? Um, so in reviewing all of that and then thinking it through, I'd like to just know a little bit more about what that means for you and, and how, you know, perhaps just becoming a mother in itself was mm -hmm. a catalyst for wanting to see change and how perhaps that could even be used as a tool to, as, to help get other people thinking about what they could do differently. Mm. And uh, yeah, I think that there are these like moments where, you know, you feel deeply connected or start thinking differently. Then, of course, like for me, one of those moments was uh, actually becoming a mom. Uh, and th then, but before then, that experience of traveling around the world and connecting with people and being immersed in the kindness of others, that was also part of that too. And then uh, business, like I, I love business because it's 
very creative and uh, it's also tough to so the business owners start their own businesses i think with some form of uh, you know passion vision or their own you know interest like a passion into something and so there are always reasons why something happens. And then I realized that when business people um, have so much to give to the world, but they end up becoming too busy and stressed or, you know, like losing that initial spark of like, this is why I started my business. That was like, a, you know, a real shame. So um, that's why to me, like it was all about connecting the dots, like human uh, beings naturally have this uh, spirit of giving and caring and empathy. Um, and then that drives us to come up with creative ideas to solve problems. Um, and the business owners are you know, great examples of how they are creatively looking at you know, something, some ways that they can add value to the world or solve somebody's problems and they start their own business. So if we connect all these dots together, then we actually have the power to solve the global problems together because there are so many businesses, so many people who care. So, yeah, so that's the kind of like a B1J1 model and harnessing that power you know, up. As you mentioned that, I, I just was struck by one thing, and that's that um, as we're going through those big changes, like as you're building a brand new company and you're full of ideas and insights, you're in this kind of state of change, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're having to be very creative, where you're creating something that's new. At the same time, when you're a new parent and you have a child in your arms, it's like your whole world has been turned a little upside down, right? Like you're in a creative space, whether or not you mm -hmm. really necessarily intend to be. You're mm -hmm. also in a moment where you can relate to and connect with other people that are on that same level. And I think a new way. So perhaps there's just something to that. Like it's a, this creative moment of, you know, entering motherhood or parenthood of, forming a new company or a new venture when you're going to be really open to possibility, right? Mm. And so if we can get people who are starting new businesses to think about something creatively early on, right? Like right as you're forming the business, how do you want to give back beyond just the service that you offer or beyond mm. the product that you offer and make that tangible and real so that the people that you're collaborating with are excited to be partnered with you, are excited to be employed with, by you, are, are excited about what you're doing. And it can also act as that fuel and passion that continues to keep you connected with the business beyond just the busyness of the everyday, mm. right? Mm. Mm. I love that intention. Yeah, that, yeah, that's a perfect way to describe it because I think like, you know, the idea of social responsibility existed for quite some time, but then it was, you know, called as CSR, corporate social responsibility. And then lots of people felt disconnected from it. So even if large companies are trying to do something, you know, for CSR, lots of people probably don't really resonate with that because it just comes from, you know, doing things because they have to sometimes. Right. But right. Then it starts to when sound small... it's too formal. I think that's it. Yeah. Right. Like you're yeah. talking corporate social responsibility. Yes. It gets abbreviated mm -hmm. CSRs and you've suddenly lost everybody as soon as it has an abbreviation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm. And when the business owners or smaller companies, when they are not required to do such a thing, like, you know, you have to do CSR, like it's not there, but then if they feel they want to do it and because they, they, they believe or they resonate with the idea or they care, then that genuine intention of doing good, how, however small or however big, actually resonate with others. And then also if we want to, because, it, you know, business takes time. So we work like, you know, so many hours uh, in our day. So it's actually more number of hours than the hours we spend with most of our family members. Mm -hmm. So actually the people we work with in businesses, uh, like our family are even kind of more important than family, right? Because they uh, get to uh, do things together. So I feel like, uh, being able to work with people that resonate with the same idea or, you know, we work toward something bigger than ourselves together, rather than always thinking about who gets more or who gets less or, you know, then uh, I think that makes our life much more fulfilling. Mm -hmm. So there is something that money cannot buy, which is like happiness or a real sense of meaning, but actually if we are able to regularly and consistently express this 
sense of caring and giving, you know, the giving spirit, and then to connect with others who resonate with that idea, it makes it so much more enjoyable to be doing the hard work that we do in business. <laughs> so it's a real win-win, I think. <laughs> No, I think you're right. Now, I also, um, you know, I've perused some of the books that you've written, at least online, read a couple of the um, intros as well. And mm -hmm. um, I found this is kind of bridging back to that earlier conversation we were having about CSRs and sustainability mm -hmm. goals, right? Um, so you were involved in a book specifically called Legacy. Um, mm -hmm. We hear a lot about sustainability, but I don't think most listeners, most of our listeners understand what SDGs mean, right? Sustainable delivery mm -hmm. goals and this um, pie in the sky idea of what we'd like to achieve by 2030. So I'd love for you to just talk a little bit about, um, you know, what SDGs are sustainable delivery mm -hmm. goals. Mm -hmm. And oh, sustainable development goals. Oh, sorry. <laughs> See, look at me. I'm even messing it up, right? <laughs> um, I want to deliver the sustainability, apparently. <laughs> um, Maybe a better way. To see yeah. It. So sustainable development goals. Pardon me for reading my notes incorrectly. Go, please. Mm -hmm. So um, sustainable development goals, there are 17 of them. And then actually, like before um, the you know, US body like uh, had the sustainable development goals, um, they had this thing called the millennium goals. And uh, uh, millennium, millennium goals were also you know, relatively known, but not probably everybody knew about it. Um, but um, it was more like uh, you know, goals that people felt that these institutions or you know, government bodies should do something about. Like it wasn't really resonant for them. So what happened was when uh, this new set of goals called uh, sustainable development goals came up, actually it started to attract real interest in the business world. And so, um, so sustainable development goals have like many different colors. So it's visually very, very interesting, but each one of these 17 goals represent some, uh, you know, main some of the main issues that we need to collectively work on so that the world will create a true sustainability and the true sustainability doesn't mean just the environmental sustainability but it's about actually like looking at certain uh, issues people experience around the world like the income gap or you know lack of opportunities or even like uh, even like behavioral issues among companies like companies need to change the way they think about uh, uh, you know, equality in the workplace or uh, diversity or so um, it covers everything basically under these 17 goals and then under 17 there are different like uh, indicators inside too but um, because it's simply visually expressed with nice vibrant colors so it's very interesting to actually like explore the information on the sustainable development goals website but what it um, does is actually it's invite everybody to be part of it's no longer about the government governments to you know, try to fix the world or uh, large foundations to do something about it. But this is really relevant for every one of us and even in small companies to look at, okay, these are the uh, uh, SDGs and our company want to especially work uh, on improving this particular you know, area in our business or through our product and services or through our effective giving. But um, the legacy book that we published um, is uh, kind of different in nature because you can learn more about SDGs, each one of them too. But we actually um, add on a story from different uh, people and the business owners or people from NGOs or different organizations to share their personal stories and the passion or ambition about the SDG that they resonate with. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a storybook, but then you, know, you get to learn about some of the global facts and what's happening and what kind of things you could do as an individual. So yeah. we wrote it to inspire you know, everybody, uh, whether it's individuals or business owners to think about what they want to do to contribute to the bigger global goals. Yeah, well, I think that's fantastic. You know, one of the things I've heard spoken of often, um, especially lately and listening to other podcasts that are specifically focused on sustainability mm. is that um, it feels like there's no real hope of attaining the sustainability <laughs> development goals by the year 2030, that 2030 feels like it's just around the corner. And yet 
we're so far behind. And that's the general sentiment that you're seeing from those who work in this space. So I wonder if you could comment on that. I mean, mm -hmm. understanding that we've already burned a few years since they were first created and, mm -hmm. um, you know, they're very big names involved in their creation from Bill Gates to Richard Branson. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so there's some big money behind producing uh, goals and, and, and actually getting to a space where we have a more equitable future for global populace. Um, but obviously we're falling a little short. So mm. what would you say mm. with that in mind? Mm. Um, I think, uh, so, so we use this expression, uh, power of small, the power of small in mm -hmm. you know, what we do, because we believe that the making a real sustainable change need to be done ground up or uh, involving everybody or changing our little habits, daily habits than trying to do big campaign or, you know, um, so one big approach cannot fix everything. So coming up with sustainable development goal is not going to fix everything in the world, even <laughs> right. if all the powerful people were part of it. But what's important is that we realize that this is for every one of us and we take part in making the sustainable future together. And if we, all of us did something little, that is more powerful than big person or big organization doing one big thing. And then thinking that that should fix everything in the world because that's not going to happen. So the, um, you know, mindset, mindset, um, change in small businesses will be very powerful because um, even though there are lots of large companies that hold great power, but actually if you look at the statistics in the world, then 97% also of economy is driven by small to medium-sized businesses around That's the right. world. Yeah. And then those businesses hire so many people around the world mm -hmm. too. So if small businesses felt empowered and they came together to start doing things together and they do it in their own unique ways. It's not one way or the other, one right way or you know, wrong way, but it's about everybody finding the ways that they want to make an impact then that creativity of entrepreneurship and the business ideas. And then the so many different great projects and NGOs or you know, like social enterprises working in the world to solve these problems. So if we connect all these little tiny dots together, we really can transform things much, much more powerfully. And it's today it's possible. It wasn't possible before. Today it's possible to link with millions of people because of the power of connections, you know, technology and the social media, open channels of interactions, conversations. Uh, so I believe that even though we are behind and we need to actually start changing things uh, faster and faster from here, um, but I think it's possible. And I've seen so many amazing, you know, giving people in the world that it's, it's, it's possible. Yeah. No, and I, I'm not saying it isn't, but I, mm. I also I think have a healthy level of skepticism that comes from yes. this. Um, you know, the reality is in the West in particular, I think we have a, a challenge where we're consistently kicking the can down the mm. road. And the reason I say that is things um, like the manufacturing that we actually do here versus in other countries. Like we're more likely to buy cheap goods that are made in another country mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. the uh, negative attributes of the pollution and everything hit that country more than our own home. Um, and we don't see it in the same way. So therefore it's not our problem, even though it's a global issue. So it's this thing where we have to continually remind ourselves that we're responsible as much for that as we are for the consumption of the gasoline that we use or the things that we throw away in our own garbage cans. Mm. And so getting to people to realize the effects we're having on a global scale is something that I think continues to be a challenge and continues to make people a little bit more reticent to take accountability mm -hmm. for the things they're personally having an effect on. Um, and that's true in business too, I think. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's just commentary. Um, yeah. I totally agree with you that small change is where it's at, because if we all make small changes, we can have a measurable impact as a group, as a collective mm -hmm. of people. And so um, one of the questions I had for you is, let's say that I'm building a small business and I only have two or three employees. I'm really just getting started. 
I mean, what recommendations would you make to somebody in that space to help them build in some level of this buy one, give one perspective? Mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's possible for any business to do this because, you know, like, for example, if you are to decide to give through B1J1, then uh, you, there are lots of giving opportunities starting from just one cent, you know, or 10 cents to do this or uh, $3 to plant this particular tree in this forest. Or, so it just, you know, every cent or dollar, uh, as as far as you could give, then you you can start with that, and you don't need to do a lot to feel good about it. Um, and then also um, uh, designing the business, uh, like as a new business, is a, probably the best time to design how you want this uh, business, you know, whether service or product, to be creating a great impact uh, uh, to the lives of cli your client and customers, but also to the greater world. So it could be a perfect opportunity to do it right up front than like, uh, you know, believing like when we become successful, we, one day we will do this too. Actually, can we actually create a, a you know, great feeling around this business and can effective giving be part of that? And you know, just allocating a small budget to be able to do so, then I think any business can. And of course, like uh, doing that is not everything because I think all the businesses can think about the impact, like, a, you know, kind of a negative impact that they could have on the environment and the planet too. So but once you are doing this kind of thing, then naturally you and your team members will start to think like, oh, maybe we should save the electricity a little bit, or perhaps we would plant a few more trees to do carbon offset in at least a part of it, or, uh, uh, you know, let, let's not print too many any papers uh, anymore. Or, so mm -hmm. I think um, that mindset shift will naturally lead toward, you know, uh, as doing, like we will start to do a little bit more of something we can do each at each stage. So we don't need to try to do big thing or everything all at once or feel guilty about creating like a negative, you know, environmental impact, but then just to doing something we could do and then continue to do so, continue to question, continue to ask questions and be curious. I think that's the key. And then in the long run, uh, together we can do so much more. I, I completely agree. So let's say I'm a business now and I've decided I want to get involved and I think I could collaborate with B1G1 to create a program. Mm. What does that look like? Just walk me through. Oh, okay. So you can, you know, visit the B1G1.com and take a look. And uh, well, actually, um, one thing I didn't really describe is how B1G1 works. But um, <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah. Let's yeah, do so that. You might go like, wow, that's a great idea, but how does it work? <laughs> So um, in B1J1, so let's say you, you know, we have a great uh, uh, system where you have a B1J1 account and you can find the project and search very easily. And then also you can create this thing called the giving story. So you can say, every time I have a meeting, I want to plant a tree. And then you set it up in your account. Then you could, uh, you know, each month give like, okay, based on the number of meetings you had, or you could even automate, you know, if you are a techie person, then you could integrate API or Zapier and then automatically track those activities. So you could do that too. So there is that mechanism to do so. And then when you are giving, fully 100% of your giving will go to the project that you choose out of hundreds of projects. So the question is then, you know, how does we want to work if 100% of giving goes? Because most fundraising initiatives would usually secretly take percentage of the donations, right? Which that's we, right. we don't do. Yeah, that's where the so, skeptic comes in, right? Like they say, wait a minute, well, how are you making money then? <laughs> Yeah, so what happened is we regard um, the businesses that we work with as members of this movement, the giving movement. So as a movement, we run this uh, on the financial budget, which is called the B1J1 Movement Fund, which is the membership contributions are coming from all the members. But because we want to make it really easy for tiny and small businesses too, as well as you know, bigger and established businesses. So the membership fee is based on the company size and you could choose like, okay, I'm a tiny business. So I contribute like a dollar a day toward the movement fund. And then uh, when I have a B1J1 account, then I can you know, display the symbol of B1J1 badge on our mm -hmm. website and then also then do the giving and knowing that every dollar and cent will go to the project. And then you can have an impact counter that you can embed on your website uh, that 
dynamically show like how many impacts you are creating or you know under different SDGs or um, so there is a lot of things you could do but they uh, you know I, I think if anybody is curious then the best place to go is to go to visit our website um, at b1g1.com. Yeah. yeah. Well, I love that you've made it simple. I think something like that um, needs to be in order for more businesses to really go, grab on and participate. But the reality is like, if you get a little badge that helps you say to the world, look, we're a caring company, we give back and this is how, mm -hmm. then that's a marketable asset. That's something that consumers are looking for as they vote with their dollars. They make decisions about the types of products and services they want to support because they're working to create a better world in their actions too. So I, I really love the simplicity of that. I also liked the stories I reviewed on your site, you know, from uh, solutions companies coming out of the gates to try and reduce food waste in New York City to, mm. um, you know, the, the water park company that teaches people to swim and for every birthday they give, you know, uh, mm. a contribution to the employee's chosen charity. I think that's beautiful. There are so many different ways that a company can decide to give back. And I think stage one is just starting a program, right? It's that simple. You just get started. Yes. So um, <laughs> are there any questions you wish I'd asked that I haven't or anything that you would like to say? Oh, no, um, I think, uh, yeah, you asked a lot of great questions. And also, I really enjoyed exploring some of the thoughts, you know, because it, it's, uh, it's quite common to be invited to podcast and said, okay, tell us what you do, how does it work, and then get into those topics, but you actually like uh, navigated the, the conversation and the stories behind the, the thoughts, right? Like, and then I think um, um, this is the important conversation that we need to have today because you said, you know, how uh, can we actually achieve all these things? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I think only way for people to really be interested in what happens behind product and the services we use, you know, because of course we can say, oh, like uh, it's better to waste less or reuse or recycle. So that, like as a moral value so that we could have these principles, but at the same time, I think actually people would change their behavior or naturally do things or make great efforts to change things if they resonated or they um, resonated with a story of someone. Mm -hmm. or felt strongly like empathetic about you know someone's pain or so actually stories are key to making people realize that they actually can do something or want to do something so um That's exactly thank you so why much for i wanted to bring <laughs> you on to tell your story i mean the reality is that you've had many lives um as a mother, as a food entrepreneur, as um, just an individual who's concerned about the state of the world. And you made a choice to make a difference and to focus your efforts on that. And I think that's really important. I also think the stories of the people you've touched so far are, are really incredible. And so I just encourage our audience to go and take a look at the B1G1 website because you'll, you'll get some inspiration, even if it doesn't affect you personally, even if you're not in New York City dealing with food waste or, um, I'm sh actually not sure where that um, swim center is, but I'm just thinking it could be any, you know, <laughs> I know that was stateside as well. So um, I encourage people to look there. These are businesses you could support and um, really just think this through um, as you're spending money and resources and as you're out there shopping, look for products and services that seek to give back and together we can create a better world. Now, I'd like to invite you to stick around for just a minute, Masami. Now, here's the question. Fellow do-gooders and friends, I'd like to invite you to be a little bit like Masami. Do you think you can do that? <laughs> I know none of us is necessarily her. We haven't had her experiences specifically, but we've had some like them. We may have been that shy person that was afraid to speak up. But think like her on hard days when tasks at hand make you feel like you're staring up Mount Everest. To quote her website, and I'm going to read this now, we can solve any problem in the world through our everyday acts because we've got so many people, so many businesses, so many transactions in our world. We just have to be a little more sharing and caring through everything we do. I think that sums it up really nicely. I thank you, Masami, for everything you are doing, inviting us all to care a little more and be better, just like this show. 
Now I'm going to link to B1G1 in show notes and on caremorebebetter.com so you can connect with Masami Seto and her organization if you're interested in pursuing a deeper understanding of her work or even soliciting her partnership. Perhaps you'll even want to purchase one of her books. For recommended, for recommended actions updated each month, please visit our website, caremorebebetter.com and click on action. It can serve as inspiration and even provide mindful gift ideas, linking to pay it forward businesses, books like Masami's, um, and more. I invite all of you to join the conversation and be a part of the community we're building. You can follow us on social spaces at Care More Be Better, or just send us an email at hello at caremorebebetter.com. And remember, this podcast is not backed by the people or the companies we feature. Our purpose is simply to get more good out into the world. If you like what we're doing, you can support the show by sharing it with some friends or by donating directly on our site. Just visit caremorebebetter.com and click the donate button. Thank you listeners for being a part of this pod and this community because together we can do so much more.